when analyzing a single market, we should also take into account trade flows with copyright products across countries. That adds additional burden for that analysis. Look at trade in licenses, trade in products, actual products, measure consumption production, which makes sound, solid statistical analysis almost impossible at the general level, at least at such a boring organization as the OECD. And with this positive statement, I will take the liberty to finish. Um, my name is not among the easiest one, but well, uh, you can always drop me a line or send me an email. I'd be more than happy to reply. And afterwards, I'd be more than happy to take some questions. Thank you. Merci. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, our uh, last speaker for this panel is Rokia Alavi, uh, Professor Alavi. Thank you. How do I handle this? Yes. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I've never done any work on copyright. My work has been always uh, on patent. So I was thinking what is the best thing to do for this uh, presentation. So I thought uh, it would be an interest for all of you to, ha uh, to have an idea on Malaysian copyright flexibilities. So therefore, on my, uh, my, paper, uh, my presentation today is on copyright flexibilities in Malaysia. Right. Uh, there are two uh, issues of concern uh, in relation to copyright flexibilities in Malaysia. First, first is uh, Malaysia has not taken uh, full advantage of many flexibilities available in the copyright uh, laws. One is uh, some of the limitations and exceptions uh, not incorporated in the Malaysian national copyright laws. Uh, this means uh, copyright owners are granted far more rights than they need to. Number two, uh, some cases, in some cases, even though there are some exceptions, uh, included in the national law, they have never been utilized. So that's the first issue. And number two is the TPPA or Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement. Free trade. It is a free trade, free trade agreement where the U.S. is pushing for higher copyright protection. And we believe that it will definitely narrow the flexibilities huh, in the copyright, uh, protection, uh, copyright law. So before I begin, I'd like to give you some uh, brief overview on Malaysia. Um, sorry. Uh, basically, Malaysia is a plural, hetero heterogeneous country. Uh, it got independence from Britain uh, in 1957. Basically, majority of the population is Malays or other Bumiputra. Bumiputra means peop uh, the aborig uh, not aborigines, the, um, the people who, the original people who live there. Uh, there's about 70 percent. Chinese, uh, about 25 percent. Indian, uh, seven percent, and others about 0.7 percent. Majority, uh, religion-wise, 61 uh, percent of the population are Muslims. Uh, Buddhism and other Chinese religions about 21 percent. Christianity about nine percent, and Hinduism is about 6.3 percent. Uh, basically, Malaysian economy has successfully transformed over the last 50 years. Uh, this, of course, we have some uh, social tensions at the moment. Uh, we have moved from a rubber and tin economy and has di diversified, industrialized, and undergone significant structural change. And it is uh, actually uh, now upper middle income country uh, targeting developed status by 2020. So that's where Malaysia is. Uh, in terms of population, it's about 30 million. Uh, GDP is about, uh, GDP growth is about 4%. Inflation, about 2%. Uh, P per, GD, uh, per, G, uh, P per capita GDP income is about 10,000 uh, USD, and unemployment rate is about 3%. Um, mainly, we are producing manufacturing products. You can see, uh, of course, services is a key uh, component of the economy. 25% is manufacturing, and agriculture has gone down from 33% uh, to 7% uh, over the years, about past 40, 50 years. 
Uh, okay, now I'm going to talk on the copyright laws. Actually, if, for an economist to talk about copyright laws is not easy, but I, I try my best. <laughs> Uh, is uh, first uh, copyright laws is first enacted in 1969. Is uh, actually we follow the British law, um, and uh, the law that governs the copyright law now is uh, the based on the 1987 Copyright Act. Uh, we are a member of uh, Bern Convention, Trips Agreement, WIPO, and also w uh, WPPT, WIPO Performance and Phonogram Treaty. Basically, we follow the TRIPS agreement. Uh, you can see the category there, literary, literary works, uh, musical works, artistic work, films, uh, sound recording and broadcast. Generally, basically, uh, the protection is life of the creator plus 50 years. Um, now I'm going to focus on four areas of limitation and exceptions, uh, where Malaysia has actually not fully utilized these limitation and exceptions. First is the parallel import. Uh, Malaysia adopts uh, domestic exhaustions. It means that copyright owners have the right to control importation of the works. And parallel, therefore, the parallel importation of any copyrighted items is prohibited. Number two is compulsory licensing. Uh, the Bern Convention allows government to issue license for making translation and print. So works uh, that is uh, published in printed or analog form of, re of reproduction, uh, that is after three years of the, the first publication. And this is only for the purpose of teaching, scholarship, and research. But in Malaysian uh, copyright law, uh, it allows uh, compulsory licensing for translation work for to national language within one year after the first publication. However, this has never been utilized. Huh? This provision has never been utilized. And the third one is anti-competitive practices. Uh, TRIPS allow uh, the national legislation, legislation to adopt appropriate measures to prevent or control licensing practices or conditions that may constitute an abuse of IP rights and have an adverse impact on competition in the relevant market. Uh, Malaysia has not uh, included in the, uh, this uh, provision in the uh, copyright law. And anti-circumvention, uh, the WCT requires members to provide uh, adequate legal protection and legal remedies against circumvention of effective technological protection measures that are used by authors in connection with the exercise of their rights. Malaysia actually has adopted this provision much earlier before it became a member. Mem we became the member only in December 2012. Okay, and uh, a little bit on the TPP. Um, TPP is a regional free trade agreement that is still being negotiated among 12 countries. Uh, these 12 countries are Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Mexico, Malaysia, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, US, and Vietnam. It is actually an ambitious and comprehensive FTA. It aims to liberalize almost all areas of goods and services and intends to go beyond the commitments uh, established in WTO. Now we are in the 19th round so far, and uh, it is expected to be uh, concluded by end of this year, which I don't think it will happen. Um, under TPPA, basically U.S. has sought to increase IP protection. It's basically push, uh, U.S. is basically pushing for standard of protection similar to that found in the U.S. law. It go, uh, definitely goes beyond trips, WCT, and WPPT. And basically, it uh, want to add another 20 years plus to the protection term. And be, uh, also seeking for expansion in the national treatment obligation to full national treatment. And also to create new uh, types of rights that are not covered by existing copyright law. And also reduce possibilities of limitation and exceptions. And finally, to also it wants to expand the obligation of the TPM, uh, Technological Protection Measures. Uh, at the moment, limited, as, you, as I've shown earlier, limitation and exception in Malaysian copyright law is very limited, and uh, definitely the benefit has accrued to the copyright owners, mostly multinational uh, companies, because Malaysia is actually a net importer of copyright products and services. And exports and uh, production is very small, and our tertiary education in the university, we are highly dependent on imported books, journals, databases, software, and also other educational materials. And therefore, we are, the tertiary education is the most affected by the narrow flexibilities. And the impact is it limits access to knowledge, curtails creativity and productivity, and slows down the economic growth. Um, a little bit on copyright-based uh, industries. This is based on the WIPO study by Kanapati. Um, the growth uh, bit of the industry between 2000 and 2005 uh, is where the value, value added has grown quite uh, significantly, about 11%, surpassed the national economic growth of 6.6%. Uh, 
The contribution of GDP has increased from 4.7% to 5.8%, and employment in this sector also has grown uh, by 10.7%. And as a result of this, we can see that the, national, the share of uh, copyright-based uh, industries in the national employment has uh, increased from 5.3% to 7.5%. Um, among the industries that are important in Malaysia, uh, that is copy, uh, that related to copyright, is one, uh, press and literature. Number two is software and databases. And three is motion and video. So these industries accounted for 88% of the value added and 91% of the total employment. Okay. Uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the publishing industry, basically this industry is relatively small and it mainly engaged in the publication of school book textbooks and related material because the schools use the uh, locally published books. Huh? That's about 70%. Uh, in 2004, um, the value of the publishing industry is only about half a, 500 million. USD. In comparison, in the US, it's worth about 30 billion. And uh, in the university, it's common for people to copy uh, because books are expensive, so it's quite common to f find people to photocopy. And you can see photocopying shops, small shops uh, around the university. Uh, awareness definitely is very low. Uh, to overcome this, Malaysia has actually established a center which is called as Copyright Control Center, where it's a, actually uh, this uh, center is given uh, will uh, issue license uh, for anybody who wants to print uh, any copyrighted work. But of course, this is not successful because lack of uh, awareness mainly. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, books, academic books in the university, uh, especially in the university, are mainly imported. We use imported books, about 60%. Uh, in 2007, about 50% uh, of these books come from US, 70% from UK, Taiwan 8%, China 8%, and Hong Kong 4%. Uh, and the worst part is uh, it is controlled by the agent uh, because people cannot freely import from overseas uh, because of the control on the parallel importation. Uh, uh, most of the books are distributed through the headquarters in Singapore and Hong Kong. And um, so basically, uh, an another important thing is that the pro foreign publisher uh, do not grant license huh, to publish local reprints and edition in Malaysia. So it makes books more expensive. The reason why they don't give license or reprinting is because the market is small. So as a result of this, um, uh, supply is limited and definitely cost is extremely high uh, in relation, in re relative to the uh, income. Huh? And in terms of motion pictures and video, uh, local film industry consists of largely Malay movies, local movies uh, for domestic market. Malaysian market is multilingual. High number of uh, movies are actually imported. In 2007, uh, about 9,000 films, films including documentary and all this, uh, are actually imported. And uh, about 70% come from US uh, and 11% in terms of total collections of from films. Uh, and 11% Malay movies, 10% uh, Chinese, and 5% Indian movies. Piracy definitely is very high. It's about 60%. Uh, and, but it's declining uh, because of the improved DVD technology. Cable TV, uh, is, there's only one. It's Monopoly, uh, owned by uh, one, one company. And it's very expensive, and programs are very limited. In terms of software and databases, uh, it is actually a very fast-growing uh, sector. A lot of locals are involved in this, uh, basically uh, involved in the original local content development in the area of education, entertainment, com commerce, and industrial activity. They produce for local market and also for export market. Uh, software market is about 1 billion USD. Uh, uh, most of the license are actually imported through, uh, through license agent, and therefore it's extremely expensive. And online database in library acqui uh, acquired through licensing agreement, again, it's high cost, and therefore at the university we don't have access to many uh, important references because of the cost. Uh, so the libraries therefore select only those uh, you know databases databases that are highly demanded, and usually they will discontinue subscri subscription of print version of journals, which is very important as a reference. Uh, software piracy is high. So um, so. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude by saying that, uh, you know, there are many, uh, not many studies, there, but some studies have shown that weakening of the flexibilities in the copyright laws leads to static and dynamic uh, inefficiencies and reduction in the economic welfare, as has been discussed earlier by the two, first two speakers. 
uh, in Malaysia because of the lack of awareness on the importance of these flexibilities. Uh, sorry, there's a lack of awareness uh, on the importance of these flexibilities in Malaysia, not only among the public but also among the uh, policy makers. And this is clearly reflected in the debates and discussion on the possible impacts because only this year I can see that people are actually discussing on the impact of IP on, in the, on, on, the, on, on the public eh? and uh, because of the TPPA. Okay? And first time I've seen that this kind of discussion has actually come, uh, is widely discussed. But uh, the discussion has been only on the uh, patents and access to medicine. And I've not seen any discussion on copyright. Mm -hmm. Uh, mainly that's because uh, lack of awareness. Huh? Um, and finally, uh, there's, therefore, there's a need to undertake, rese undertake research on copyright flexibilities. Uh, so far, uh, there's no economic analysis on this uh, has been done in Malaysia. Okay. With that, I'd like to thank. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, this is what we'll do. Um, We'll invite people to uh, ask questions. If you could, uh, for the purposes of our uh, webcast audience, come and use the speakers up front. Uh, that would be nice. And if, if you can, identify yourself so we get to know you. Uh, so, uh. Yeah, my name is John Floyd. I've been on the for a long, long time, and we do things internationally. And I've always had the reason I was interested in coming here, and it's kind of all the panels, but the, the last one, is there any enforcement mechanism with this TPPA? Uh, because that's always the problem of how do you, when they take something from our clients and it's particularly overseas, if it's not in Western Europe or America or Canada, you know, we, we're kind of like, you know, up the river without a paddle. And so is there any enforcement mechanism either planned or already, uh, that already exists? Uh, enforcement uh, related to copyright, is it? Yes. Uh, your copyright, trade infringement, the whole intellectual property package. Yeah, it's part of the negotiation, how to uh, to enhance uh, uh, IP protection. Yeah, but does I it exist? I mean, is there a form? I spent a lot of time eight, ten years ago trying to develop some type of NAFTA court, and there was all these meetings with Canadians and Mexicans, and in the bottom line, nothing happened. My question is, is there any forum or any plan for a forum where someone who finds a breach of copyright or trademark infringement can go and actually um, resolve whatever the matter happens to be? Okay. Um, well, what, what I thought might be a, a little bit more efficient uh, is to collect questions first, Sorry, and then we'll turn to the audience. So I think we have another gentleman. Would you like to use a speaker? So uh, please. Uh, Good afternoon. My name is Morad Ekbal, uh, previously at the University of Baltimore Center for International and Comparative Law, now with uh, Plasmera Technologies LLC. Uh, as just a general question, will the PowerPoint slides be available on the website for us to utilize, or are they all proprietary and no. protected? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, Thank you for that answer. Uh, the, the question I have is, is actually really a twofold question, if I may, and that is that I seem to detect a presupposition in the entire presentation that all of the copyrights are either being held by individuals or by corporations. I mean, uh, is, is that a correct perception? Because if there isn't, then the business of life plus 50 years in the context of a corporation really doesn't make sense. A corporation could be existing for 100 years plus 50, or it could be in perpetuity. So I'd like the panelists to speak to that, not necessarily from a legal standpoint, but what the economic component is as to a differentiation between an individually held copyright versus a company held copyright. And then the second question I have related to that, and it relates to the, what the gentleman just asked, uh, might it not make more sense from the standpoint of developing a kind of a global regime as has been discussed by the panelists, to focus on harmonizing the remedies for breach, not unlike a NAFTA regime, but it's not a good analogy because there are lots of issues with the NAFTA regime, but something different where we can actually get a definitive response that helps with remedies in case of breach from an economic standpoint. I don't want to get into the legal because that's the second panel. I want to see whether there is an economically compelling reason to say, yeah, we really should be focusing on developing economic remedies 
before we get to harmonizing everybody else. So it's a spoke of the wheel, different spokes. Everybody can have a different regime, but they all end up on the center of the remedies. Thank you for considering my question. Thank you. And uh, a third question. Yes, uh, Martin Senfleben from the Free University Amsterdam. Um, it is my understanding that this meeting is particularly on copyright flexibilities. So I'm wondering if our colleague from the OECD could add some further information on a paper that I personally found very interesting in that area, which was called uh, Participative Web, uh, User-Generated Content. I think an OECD study of uh, a couple of years ago, 2007 or 8. Um, so I would be particularly interested in the methodology used for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so why don't we uh, turn to our panel. Uh, Professor Alavi, would you like to address the uh, first question? Um, okay, um, for the enforcement, uh, I'm referring to the relation case here. Yeah? Uh, we have actually now IP court. Uh, it's just established in 2008. So all the, um, you know, all the infringement of IP is actually now brought to the IP court, which is, uh, you know, as a significant improvement in the IP enforcement. Hmm? Where does it stay? Where is the court? Where does it stay? Where? I mean, you can ask him the Where, where does this court? Is it only in Malaysia, or is it someplace, does the court sit someplace? Oh, I, I really don't know about the copyright from the legal perspective. I am sorry, I mean, yeah. I know in Malaysia we have IP court, uh, but internationally, I, anybody can help. I, I really don't uh, know about the you know, legal perspective of this enforcement. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, to, I don't to know. be pursued. <laughs> if you ask about Malaysia, I, I know a little bit from the legal perspective. Otherwise, I'm sorry. I, I don't okay. So then there's this question about corporations versus individuals and also economic remedies. If, uh, uh, Anyone would like to address that? Or? Well, I think it's primarily a legal question, really, how you define uh, this life issue if, if, if copyright rests with the organizations. But I can say that there's no academic, economic research whatsoever that proves that such a long term would be efficient in terms of dynamic effects on creation of works. Um, and I know that, I mean, in many areas, uh, the copyright is defined, even if it's transferred to a corporation, with the life of the original author. But I, for, for, for group works, that, that is probably different. I don't know the finances of that. But um, um, for, for, for individually created works like books and songs, um, even if the uh, right is transferred to a, to a, a corporation, um, the life of the physical uh, writer of the word uh, of the work is uh, uh, is definitive. Okay. Yeah, sure. I think there was also a, a duration aspect in that question. Um, the duration of copyright and the extension of copyright duration have been, as you might know, um, uh, very contentious. Also amongst economists, um, the um, some people like Arkelov and a couple of other famous uh, economists got in there and they argued that it would re it's ridiculous to retroactively, um, from an economic perspective, doesn't sound like a good idea to retroactively extend. I would be a bit more cautious about this, um, for example, because um, the very corporations that get a windfall benefit for something they created in the past anyway, um, that is now perhaps worth more because copyright lasts longer, um, they might reinvest, right? So um, that's an, an, an added dimension. Um, there's also lots of indication that copyright duration is really rather long indeed. And um, I can't give you a firm answer um, on, um, on the economic evidence in this respect. The extreme positions are also clear. Some people say there should be perpetual copyright but with an obligation to, um, to um, renew claims after a shorter period of time than we have now, perhaps against some kind of modest payment, just to make sure that we don't, uh, we don't have too much out of the public domain that, that no one is interested in commercializing anymore, in that, you know, as, a, as the um, um, copyright holder. And then the other position would be to make it a lot shorter. Initially, I think it was 14 years in the centuries of N. And many people argue that uh, shorter copyright duration would be now, again, better for the technological environment that we do have. That's a rough description of what I've read other people argue about this. 
Harmonization of remedies, I think, is a super interesting topic, but I think there's, I'm not aware of any international project on the matter. On the national level, some levy kind of systems and so on, I think, are pretty similar to what you were describing. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, just, just one addition to that. If, you, if you're talking about remedies against uh, infringement, like enforcement measures, I think we're still in the middle of finding out what really works and what doesn't. So in this stage, I'd say let flowers grow if you want to have them grow at all. Um, and, and let countries find out. And France, I think, has just found out that the uh, uh, three strikes legislation wasn't really uh, the, the great solution. And I think we need some more time of, of, of trial and error on that respect, what works and what doesn't work, before we could harmonize. Otherwise, you would end up harmonizing towards the wrong thing, perhaps. Okay, let's answer the third question before we get to the next question. So, up here. Uh, let me just add on the issue on harmonization of remedies. Um, I fully agree that first we need to know uh, which solution works before we kind of promote implementation of the solution at the global level. Here the issue would be actually also in developing a mechanism to assess these remedies, a mechanism that would be accepted generally by all the countries. And it's trivial to say that international negotiations that involve all the countries, not only OECD countries, but all the countries are extremely long and, uh, well, Negotiations take lots of time. An example could be negotiations with WIPO about exceptions of copyright with respect to accessibility issues for, I guess, vision impaired people. It's a, it's a small thing and it takes ages to, to conclude uh, on this. So, harmonization of remedies, I can imagine, that would be a major project that would take years. Um, concerning the question on, um, on paper and particip participative web, I think, thank you so much for recalling it. It's a pleasure when someone actually notices our research. Uh, actually, this, this paper took a different perspective on participant web. It took business model perspective. We tried to present what actually, what is this phenomenon in 2007, so a bit long ago, it's an old paper already. We tried to illustrate existing business models, monetization issues, and role of technology, and we tried to measure it, relate uh, this new business models with, uh, hey, for example, high-speed internet or um, accessible internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, concerning the copyright issue in this context, we recognize it. However, due to measurement issues and due to other issues that are mostly of political nature, we haven't decided to go into it, to go too deep into it, in order to avoid too superficial message that could be just misinterpreted. Um, uh, please. Thanks. My name is Austin Sfandiari. I'm with Telespheres, and I appreciate uh, the thoughts that you've all shared in the analysis. Um, I'd like you to take, a, if you can, uh, a virtual telescope or binoculars and try and look towards the future. Um, as we know in life, there's always this pendulum that swings from one side to the other, and from your presentations, I get the sense that the pendulum from your analysis is swinging against the benefit of copyright IP um, and greater ways or benefits from benefiting with marginalizing the IP portion. My question with a, with a long lens, looking forward in time, is it possible with the pendulum swinging back and forth that you might have at some point a new paradigm. For example, as we see in the United States, there is privatization of government services. Would it be possible that copyright holders might end up going to a private regime, uh, some company like today's Google or Microsoft, to say we will enforce uh, copyright on a global basis? Uh, could it ever come to that uh, economically? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, another question, then we'll combine. Yes. Uh, Rebecca Giblin from Monash University. Uh, my question probably is uh, largely for Piotr, but maybe the other panelists have some insights as well. You know, we, we really emphasize, uh, empathize with you, I think, about the challenges associated with measuring the impact of digital infringement. But I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about the methodologies you have in mind for overcoming those in the studies that you're doing in the future, or if the others have any insights in it. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay, one more, Jeremy De Beer. 
Jeremy Beer, University of Ottawa. Just a direct follow-up on that. In talking about the methodologies, could you talk about the difficulty presented by this duality that I think only you alluded to, Hughes, which is that uh, the same industries are both uh, protected by copyright and benefit from the limitations and exceptions. So when you do these macroeconomic analyses, you get the same contributions to GDP. Uh, and so I wonder if you could talk about the difficulty, methodological difficulty in that sort of um, duality or uh, schizophrenia between uh, a, a user and a, and a copyright holder. Okay, thank you. Um, so if someone could address the, the first question about um, the pendulum where it's going. Well, let me have a crack. I'm, I wish I knew the future. Then I would just pick the six right numbers in the upcoming lottery drawing. <laughs> but uh, considering the future of copyright, well, uh, anything that comes to my mind can happen. But there are two aspects that I would like to draw attention on. Actually, um, copyright in the age of the Internet tends to be associated with Internet as something that is given and will be developed in the future. Um, recent negotiations that were also on the ITU show that it may not necessarily be the case. Internet, the future of Internet is uncertain. And if the future of the Internet is uncertain, it's also likely that thing that we call today copyright might change and might call for further amendments um, if global web becomes something new. Another thing that really copyright might rely on is global payments. Um, for the moment, one of the big obstacles for development of new business models that, took advantage, that could take advantage of the Internet is lack of global payment scheme or there is fixed costs related to copy, uh, credit card possession or payments with different currencies. If this becomes solved, then one big bottleneck for the global copyright system is clear, and then perhaps market forces could promote establishment of new business models that we cannot even imagine right now. There was a question about the methodology uh, here um, that we have used. Is it about the upcoming methodology in the project? On well, um, this project hasn't been approved yet by our member countries, so I'll, actually I would like to uh, postpone this into a coffee break. I'll be happy to discuss you in a bilaterally, but I don't think I have a mandate to talk about this issue that wasn't actually cleared by member countries for the moment. Okay. Christian? Um, may I have a word on the um, private services of enforcement? Actually, I remember, or at least when I go back to the literature written before my time in the 90s and early millennium, around the millennium, many people were actually worried that private technical protection measures um, would overshoot and do away with the exceptions and limitations and what was considered to be a reasonable balance between uh, copyright enforcement and some, uh, well, exceptions and limitations. Um, at the current point in time, um, private enforcement has pretty much failed. And I think that raises an important question that not many people are you know, incorporating or at least expressing clearly that what rights holders are doing is saying, well, um, it's not efficient for us to do it ourselves. Which raises, of course, the question, first of all, why should governments be better at that? Right? Uh, why should they be more productive regarding the enforcement? There might be good reasons for that. After all, they have the executive. Nevertheless, the next question is, if we rely more on public enforcement, which I think is is something that we see a trend towards, or which is at least considered. If we go more towards public enforcement, um, how would governments know the right amount of enforcement? Right? We think about trade-offs all the time in economics. And there will be decreasing, uh, decreasing um, util marginal utility of investments in enforcement. And that is a really tricky question regarding um, public enforcement that I think is often glossed over. Um, so that's my uh, reaction to that. We might very well return to the initial question that people have, have raised. Is a private enforcement going to do away with copyright law and all the fine, intricate balances that it's supposedly developed over the 20th century? Yeah, in response to, uh, to Jeremy's question about duality or, uh, if you like, schizophrenia, um, well, I think the point is really made 
by performing those studies on, on the industries uh, relying on exceptions and limitations, um, you, it's, it's very easy to abuse the outcome of such studies. I think they serve a purpose to analyze, uh, as you, you pointed out about Malaysia, in what way an economy has, has kind of uh, transformed into an information-based or service-based economy. And comparing those numbers, if you do them, the studies on the same basis in all countries, and that's what WIPO is striving for, serves a purpose in comparing and understanding uh, economies and, 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 and pointing the way economies might want to move. They don't point anywhere uh, in the debate if limitations, exceptions, flexibility should be stricter, more lenient, whatever. And I think that point is made by, by, by pointing out this, this schizophrenia. And even on a micro level, uh, I think it's, it, it may be interesting to say that we, we did a, a large survey amongst creators and performers in the Netherlands, and one of the questions we asked them was if they would download from illegal sources themselves. Um, and I mean, they were in their income dependent on, on copyright to a large extent, but I think about 30% admitted to downloading from legal sources themselves, which is slightly lower at the time uh, than the percentage over the general population in the Netherlands doing so, but still quite high, and even, I mean, correcting for the fact that they were admitting to it. And quite a large majority of them actually said, yes, I download from legal sources, and I think that more strict enforcement should be there on downloading from legal sources. So, talking about schizophrenia. Um, <laughs> But I think the point that, that should be, or the lesson that should be learned from, from that point is that they're actively, very actively using other works as an input, or at least that's the positive lesson I can draw. Um, so they're relying on copyright, yes, but they're also highly dependent on being able to access information, to access other works and build on them. I think uh, from developing countries' perspective, uh, most of the countries are actually copyright users. They are not developers. They are not copyright owners. And therefore, the flexibility, limitation and flexibility are very important for future development. You know, without that, uh, it's very difficult to move. It's similar to patent. We can see, I mean, I, my work, work has been completed, and it's obviously it has been shown that with a stronger patent protection, it has actually impeded uh, growth in many developing countries, including Malaysia. Uh, from copyright, it's also the same. Uh, limitation and flexibilities are very important for future development. Weakening that, I mean, Malaysia is very, it's very sad uh, that the, the policymakers have not seen this. Uh, they have not really used the limitation and flexibilities. So, uh, and we, uh, uh, copyright, yes, I, mean, I don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, basically, we are using copyright, so it's very important. Okay, uh, no more questions? Okay, then uh, let's take a short 10-minute uh, ten, ten break, and don't forget there's a roundtable coming up, so please stand by. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, Oops, uh oh. You want a hand or you got it? So on um, the website, Hedge of Impact, um, there will be places that can also be um, the friend tip. Um, the email address can be caught up by the end of the week. You can just put it up. Right, so if you have a friend, I want to get advice from
This is the greatest little like speaker party favor I've ever seen. That's fantastic. That's totally useful. <laughs> they should do that in uh, Amsterdam where you really need to. <laughs> We're going to reconvene if people can start to take their seats, please. If I can have the speakers rejoin us. Yeah. Alan, that would be you. <laughs> we need you. Yes. <laughs> We would just All right, welcome back. Um, so I'm Michael Carroll. I'm the director of the program on information justice and intellectual property. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here in the room and on the web. Um, and so uh, that was a rich presentation of the um, empirical framework by which copyright limitations and exceptions are, are and are not being measured. Um, and now we're going to ask the lawyers uh, in a roundtable format to do two things, to um, respond to some of what we heard from the, the, the uh, economists, but also to talk to us a little bit about um, what the current situation is in, in uh, various parts of the world regarding copyright limitations and exceptions. Um, one of the reasons for this meeting is a number of countries are revising their copyright laws, and in that process, um, the topic of limitations and exceptions has come up in part because many legal systems have a very set or closed list of uses that are permitted without the copyright owner's permission. And um, that list often is, lacks the flexibility to adapt to changes in technology. So whether the ability to scrape a news headline off of a news site and aggregate that is a permitted use or not is an issue that gets treated differently under different legal systems. Um, and there are some view, who view the economic effects of that as being relatively negligible and ought to be a permitted use, but because it's not on the list, it is treated as a source of liability. So examples like that put pressure on the existing laws to adapt. And one of the, so we're in the middle of legislative debates around the world. And one of the questions that arises over and over in those debates is what, are the, what is the evidence? What is the evidence that's relevant to why we need uh, new limitations and exceptions to open up innovation, open up the possibilities of investments in these kinds of uses compared to the costs and harms to right, rights holders if these uses are permitted without remuneration or without um, a copyright owner control? So we have a, a star-studded panel here, and I'll just quickly introduce them. Then I'll ask each person to give us about four or five minutes of uh, preliminary thoughts, of, uh, both in reaction. And then I have a few questions that we can kind of go back and forth. So let's see if, I'm, if we're lined up. We are. All right. This is great. To my immediate right, Jeremy DeBeer uh, it comes to us from the University of Ottawa in Canada and also teaches a summer class here at WCL on the relationship between intellectual property and sustainable development. And next to him is Rebecca Giblin from the Monash University in Australia, although presently resident in California at Berkeley. Um, uh, Carolyn Mube from the University of uh, Cape Town in South Africa is probably our most distant traveler this time, and uh, we're very uh, glad she's here. Alberto Cerda is a PhD candidate at Georgetown University and also a professor at the Universidad de Chile. 
Um, Martin Sintleben from the uh, University of Amsterdam uh, is with us. Um, and then Jennifer Urban is also at UC Berkeley Law School. Uh, finally, we have Alan Rocha, or not finally, well, finally in this case, because Alan Rocha comes to us from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And our last panelist, Pranesh uh, Prakash, is, has been delayed in transit. There's a possibility he'll join us at some point in the afternoon, but uh, I think we'll, we'll be missing him. He works with Sunil, our keynote, so we will at least get some of the Indian perspective um, in this conversation, if not from Pranesh right now. So with that, let me just uh, open the floor and each of you give us some reactions. But, but I would ask, since we know that we are in a legislative debate about copyright reform, if you could reflect on and talk about the ways in which empirical evidence, economic evidence, economic effect,